wealth creation is through owning property over a long period of time. Yeah. It's not trying to, again, trying to like mm. do a quick flip. Yeah. Flipping is a strategy. I'm sorry, guys. If you, if you flip, you're wasting your fire. I didn't love the statement was because if I owned the property that I first ever did 10 years ago yeah. and I sold for 310,000, right now that property is worth 340,000. Flipping for me, one, stability wise, as a vehicle, I don't see it because if I don't flip, I don't make money. I'm like, well, what are you doing? You're not building wealth. If you were happy with having one property, then after you had that one property, your recurring income would stay the same. You'd have to do nothing else. If you want to grow a portfolio, you have to continue working. One's recurring yeah. and one isn't. One requires you to actively go. So once I've made that recurring income, it's, mm. it's going to come regardless of whether I do my next project or don't do my next project. You raising money is you working. You having to have those phone calls, you having to speak to investors. That's my philosophy around why I, I feel like, feel like people are wasting their time, energy into flipping, where it's, there's so many like uncertainties as well around it. Trying to find an exit buyer, things get delayed. It's the same premium that people get from buying a new home. People yeah. are paying because it's brand new. Yeah. So you get the most amount of money day one for it. That's often the best time to sell. If you are a good allocator of money and the how money works you've got to assess your portfolio at a point in time and assess is that money truly working hard for me when you choose to do that you say okay you've got to pay these investors back and that's it done when i choose to do that i can just go and buy all those hmos when i want them you're not defined by where you, where you come from yeah. and i think that's a big message that i always yeah. want to tell people like like you have to be able to be uncomfortable yeah. like be comfortable with being uncomfortable When you grow up in ends, you don't realise it when you're confident, but you have an audacity to do things that ordinarily most people wouldn't be willing to do. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. we got a bit of a different one today. It's going to be a little bit of a debate between Kazi and Alfred. You've obviously seen the clip at the beginning, you heard Alfred saying that flipping is BS, rent to rent is BS. So we got Kazi here to reply to that. But yeah, let's start with Alfred. You're on my left. How you doing, bro? I'm good, bro. Thanks yeah. for the invite. Can't wait. <laughs> That's mad too. As you said, give a little bit of obviously if the people don't know who you are, who who is Alfred? So property investor um, based in the Midlands. Um, been investing in HMOs for the last four years. Built a four million pound portfolio in three years alone. Uh, raise a lot of capital to be able to get started and and get into property and i've been doing that since and that's been, been my bread and butter all right cool thanks what about you kazi kazi uh property investor developer mm. um focused predominantly in london mixture of strategies uh between flipping um residential conversions and obviously building a portfolio alongside that i've been doing it for like the last 11 years mm. okay cool you know what, I want to start off, I'm not going to go rent to rent because we can't give the people what they want straight away. I'm going to start with another part, deal sourcing. So Kazi, I remember you said that deal sourcing is a good place to start, right? Do you still believe it's a good place to start in property, especially when you're starting as a beginner? I think for a number of reasons, um, it can be. Mm. Because if you are if you don't have the capital to get started, um, it's a really good place to build relationships. Like if you're able to like home a skill mm. that's valuable, not only to you, but other people within the industry, regardless of what your long-term goals are, if you can be able to establish, isolate, and be able to, you know, negotiate good deals, mm. I think you know, it's a lot easier to find the money or to find people to work alongside or to build relationships with those people that are in a position to pull the trigger. So I think it ticks a lot of boxes and it can also pay quite well. Yeah. Okay, cool. What do you think, Alfred? What's your response to that? <laughs> I don't know why you think I'm going to be negative. Actually, I actually, actually like think, that, yeah? I actually cool. think deal sourcing is out of the strategies for, if you want to mm. pick one to kind of get started on. Yeah. It can be a strategy that you start with and I actually can say that, that that is a skill that you actually are acquiring, which will help you when it comes to actually starting to buy for yourself. So I, I actually don't mind deal sourcing as a strategy. Okay, cool. You land on that, you see? We found something. Know, no, the thing is, I think <laughs> like me and Alfred will probably be aligned on more things than maybe people expect. Yeah. I think it's just, um, you know, horses for courses and different mm. different strategies at different times. Everything everything is about time and fit for purpose, I guess. Yeah, one, one thing I'll say, look, there is no right or wrong like I, that, that I want to get clear. Like there, this mm. is just... I guess my opinion, Kaz's opinion, and you can choose to do whatever you want to do, yeah, but I have just, I guess, principles about how I go about making decisions and that will mm. come apparent as we talk um, yeah. as to why I, se I select certain things versus other things. Yeah. I think the important thing is, like you said, it's um, different opinions, mm -hmm. different approaches, right? But it's like, sometimes it's good to 
like analyze the approach and then see what the weaknesses are, right? Because mm-hmm. obviously there's always going to be strengths of things, but it's always good to like see what the weaknesses are so people understand. Yeah. Because yeah. I think sometimes when these things are presented to people, they don't really understand, okay, what could actually What the downside is, mm-hmm. yeah. What could yeah, go yeah, wrong, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's always good to be able to like, you know, clash on that. Okay, so let's talk about Rent to Rent. Obviously, mm-hmm. Alfred, you had strong feelings on it. It yeah. didn't seem like you were a fan of it. So yeah, yeah. elaborate um, a bit more on, you know, your feelings on rent to rent. So very simply, rent to rent for me as a strategy, when I ask the question to a lot of people like, why is it you going to rent to rent? Or what, what, what is the reason why you wanted to get into property in the first place? A lot of people start with, I want to create financial freedom, I want to get time freedom. So for me, rent to rent doesn't offer that. Mm-hmm. Like I don't, I don't, no one can explain to me how rent to rent is going to make you have generational wealth, have create time freedom all these things that are associated with, with getting into this vehicle that provides you cash flow. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like, why have you gotten into a vehicle that doesn't give you the outcome you want? And that's my philosophy around like, what what, what is the purpose? What is that, what's that vehicle serving you if it doesn't solve for your outcome? Some might say, oh, well, I'm going to use it to get started. Okay, that's what we talked about on the podcast. Let's let's do the maths. What do you mean you're going you're gonna to use that to get started? I build the capital, start buying. In reality, for a lot of people going to rent to rent, you're not going to make the money required to start buying and if you do, it'll be over a much longer period. So my position on this is like, why would you not learn the skill of raising capital? Um, it's what I did. I didn't I didn't think, oh, because I haven't got the money, I'm gonna now get into rent to rent or do other strategies, lesser strategies to try and build the capital up to get started. And so it's for me, I'm solving for the real problem, which is I don't have the capital. How can I get in? And for me, I believe raising capital is a faster, more efficient way to do so than trying to mm-hmm. ultimately, in my opinion, create another job through rent to rent, which again, people say you wanna you wanna have this time freedom but you've just gone and created another vehicle that takes up all your time mm-hmm. to manage these tenants and be the middleman between the landlord and the um, tenant to try and make a bit of money at 500 pound a thousand pound per, per yeah. property which for me is like it's backwards thinking i'll just look at increasing my my skill set at work and allow me to earn more and be able to save and not have all my hours taken up yeah. on both my job and the rent to rent operation cool. so that's that's just my belief on that one fair Mm. Kazi, what's your response to what Alfred yeah. is saying and these points that he made? I think I think it's interesting because obviously for someone who's like actively built a HMO portfolio, um, when you went to build that portfolio, when you speak, spoke about properties, they're only making five hundred, a thousand pounds versus yeah. the money you have to put into them. You know, if you build a HMO portfolio and these properties are making a thousand to three thousand pounds a month, but the level of exposure and, and like you know and potentially the level of risk you have from the level of debt you have these are all things that are personal attitudes towards risk also having the capital or wanting to have the exposure to that level of tiered debt because if you're raising like investment you're raising investment you're going to have a principal lender you're then effectively <coughs> raising like mezzanine finance for when you're raising the investor finance so you're geared up at probably close to 100%. And a lot of people don't have the appetite for that. So they would rather start out with something they feel more confident in. And that's not to say neither strategy is valuable, but I think there's a, a, a massive importance when it comes to looking at fit for purpose and pe- everybody has a diff- different attitude towards risk and a different risk appetite. And I think when we sometimes, you know, <laughs> talk negatively about specific strategies that might work really well for people. My concern is that we isolate people that have, you know, an idea. And you also spoke at the beginning about not everybody is looking to build generational wealth. Some people's, and and that's up to them. Like that might not be what you, what is favorable for you, but not everybody is looking to build generational. Some people's, I like, you know, what they're looking from, from rent to rent is, an opportunity to do something else. To, it might be to be able, they, they currently work in a nine to five where they have to be in an office. And what they want to do is something where they can have an opportunity to one, create a high level, higher level of earnings and two, also maybe work from home. And that might be their goal. So I think you've got to be a bit careful about looking what individual goals are as opposed to like blanketly pushing your goals out onto everybody else. I wouldn't say I'm pushing my goals out to everybody. I think um, the, the realization I want people to have is just align whatever your outcome is to the strategy you're getting into. Yeah. If you talk about wanting to have time freedom, you wanted to have generational wealth, you wanted to. Um, but time freedom look- is relative. So 
the person that wants a certain amount of time freedom, yeah, that business model may give them a lot more time than what they're currently doing. Some the, somebody may not because when you first work, you said you spoke about what people are saying. They might want time. They might want to increase. That might be their goals. <laughs> yeah, they might want to build capital out to start start, and that's a big they, one. They want they, they want to build the capital out. So ultimately, a lot of people are getting to rent to rent. Generally, are getting to as a startup to kind of get capital to start buying. And for yeah. me, that philosophy is kind of flawed in a sense. Not flawed. Like, of course, you can use rent to rent to get into profit. No, but like, when we did a math, we don't disagree there. Yeah. Like, I don't think yeah. rent to rent, unless you're amazing at it, and it's going to be the top one percenters, maybe top five percenters, if you're lucky. Let's be real, one percent, bro. Let's are gonna one percent. <laughs> Swear down. I mean, okay. It, yeah, no, I think it doesn't really seem like that to it's, people though. That is one no, percent. I think, I think people will think that maybe. In terms like of a lot. people, people, I think people aren't looking at the wider picture. So when you when you earn the money, you're going to pay tax on this money. If you're a corporation, you're going to pay tax on this money. Like yeah. you're not, it's not you're not people that are making a thousand pound profit, make two thousand pound profit from rent to rent. They haven't taken into account the money they sunk into and understand how business actually works. Mm. I.e., the capital, your 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 negative whatever the investment has been when you started in that vehicle mm. to when you start breaking even. I.e., you generate the profit for the few months and now I actually starting to make profit from that. So yeah, year two, year three, that's all net profit. But let's be real. A lot of people that are, I don't, people that start rent to rent don't follow through for that level of time. Yeah, no, like there's there's a lot of there's a lot of people that do rent to rent again. Like I said, and they are literally in a case of they want something they have more control over. It's, a, it's the same reason that not everybody that opens up their own restaurant mm. wants to become the next McDonald's. I I, I get that. I get that. No. I, and, and I guess the, the comment here is just align whatever your outcome is. Are trying to achieve. Just make sure the vehicle you're going aligns to that and actually makes sense to, yeah. to actually get you to the outcome. Because if not, my thing is why start something. I, I guess I'm a believer of like, my belief system is the thing that I'm getting needs to solve my outcome, like solve mm. my outcome. And if it's not, why start it? Mm. You don't think, you don't believe in like stepping stones to to get so, somewhere. Uh, like, yeah. Cause that, that's how people, people see yeah, it, right? I, I, like I, I, a bit I, of a stepping stone. Maybe don't get them it, to world creation now, but maybe it's like a pre-step to you know, to the okay, path that you want and, to. And, and this is the bit, I guess, uh, uh, the bit I value more time. Okay. So we can spend, our, I personally would rather spend, let's say yeah. we, someone spent two years mm. um, trying to build a rent to rent portfolio to make money to start buying, for example. Mm. And I said, no, and they want, I don't want to do rent to rent. I want to solve for, how can I be of value, for example, to someone that's yeah. got money? So you have to start buying, whether it's a capital raise or a joint venture partnership to get mm. into deals. But I start owning property and I start making income, which I then yeah. have, I actually own the asset. I would rather do that. Yeah, but for me, that that that's that's where I see the value in because it actually solves for my outcome, which is trying to build wealth. But you have to think about what that looks like on average, like in terms of that thing of okay, so you want to get into start owning assets. Yeah. What's the steps for you starting to own assets? Learn for first of all, get educated. I mean, I'm literally telling what people what I did. I'm just not even it's not even me telling you what 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 to do is. No, what this I, is what, what your yeah, the whole thing what, about the conversation was about what your opinion is. So this yeah, is, so, doesn't so, matter. So, what so, so yeah, opinion. so yeah. for me, get educated mm -hmm. on the, the the thing that you're the vehicle you're going to. So if it's HMOs, buy to lets, whatever, get educated in that strategy. Once you get educated in that strategy, and you have ability to put a team together to show that you can execute and allocate money correctly, mm -hmm. you are now valuable to someone that has money. From that perspective, now you can present opportunities to people to either come on board with you. Or on a loan basis, they can borrow you money, go yeah. into those assets, start buying, and you structure how you want to run your business. And that's okay. that's for you to operate. Yeah. You are now on your way to buying. And that's yeah. that's what I did. Yeah. I didn't think about doing deal sourcing, rent to rent, to try and build capital out. Okay. I didn't have the money, but I said, okay, there is a way in which I can learn a skill, mm. which is one, to learn how to raise capital, and two, learn how to find great, amazing deals to be able to allocate that money that I raised to but those would, deals to then start buying. Would you not be of the same opinion that it's only the top one, five percent, whatever the case may be, wait, that do that whole, okay, I'm gonna go down raising capital and actually successful in it. I, there's more, I, I can hand a heart. Do you think there's more I, I, people I, I, that can do what you yeah, do? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's 100%. Than rent to rent. 100%, 100%, 100%. Rent to rent. Okay. 100%. I've seen okay. more So people. that's why you feel that strongly about it, because you I've feel seen, like I've seen that's a, lot, a better I've, path. Yeah, right? I've seen a lot okay. of people, um, actually learn and if, again don't sometimes people come into this thing thinking that it's how can i amass 100 grand from somebody who, who in the right man's gonna give me 100 grand but again you're 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 inflicting that self belief on yourself uh, that belief on yourself and you're in a way self-sabotaging so it's like you haven't even tried you haven't even given that an attempt you're just thinking oh my i have nobody in my know there's nowhere i can raise money but you haven't 
you're not praying from the mindset of like, how can I be that person that can attract that money? Mm. And it is possible. For me, I'm going to push that. It, of course it's possible. No, I think Anything's that, possible if you, that, if you truly that, want it. That, that's the thing though, that anything is possible and it is possible. It's possible in a sense, and I'm not a huge advocate of rent to rent, by the way, yeah. but I'm just saying it is possible <laughs> in the rent to rent space in the same way mm. it's possible in the raise and finance space because in the same way you've seen countless so, so, people- so which, so, so, so which, so let's be- No, but let me, let me finish. But in the yeah. same way you've seen countless people that have been successful in raising finance, mm -hmm. I've seen countless people People that have been successful in raising finance, but that's all they're good at and have just messed up the deals and lost people's money. So like there's always going to be a mm. based on what you're doing and based on your experience of things that you've seen and ways in which you choose to operate. And that's why a lot of stuff is very subjective and comes down to opinion. And, and, and that's why we said, look, there is no right or wrong. I think just get clear on what you want to do and, and select mm. what vehicle you think gets you to the outcome. And that's true to you. Okay, cool. All right, let's move on to flipping. Because that's what Kazi does. And I, you know what's crazy? I didn't when I was saying what I was saying to you, I didn't think this episode would happen. I just said to you, Oh, I know somebody because I know, I know at, at the time I've been I didn't guess I didn't, my first incident wasn't guessing Yeah, because I, I don't see Kazi as someone that just no, does so he, he's, he's, he's well way rounded. Much more, yeah, way, yeah, way, yeah, so, way more, yeah. So I don't I don't put in that category. Yeah. So when I'm when yeah. I'm when I'm when I'm saying that statement, I'm not you're not, no, you're no, not, no, bro. So, I don't, I, you know me. <laughs> I, I say way wilder stuff. I just say it on camera <laughs> than Alfred. So I don't take anything personally. And like, cool, cool, cool. Like, right, you know, good, so good. It's, it's more than fair. Like, yeah, me, yeah. me and Alfred have jokes on camera. Yeah, no, of camera. course he wasn't at I've got, you. Man, no, yeah, but yeah. even no. Even but the thing is, I could say something that's not like a, a Alfred, yeah. but it might be at something, but it's just, that's life. Yeah. Like, there's people that like you might play football with and they're mad fit. And so I say, oh, all them not do is run up and down the wing. <laughs> like, but it's just, that's that might be what they're really good at. Yeah, it's just not yeah, my yeah. personal preference. Yeah. And I think there's always a way in which like, in business, we have our own skills. We have our own flair and the ways of doing mm. things. So I'm not the guy to take anything personally. Like I'm the first guy to be like, oh, why don't you like it? Oh, let me, because yeah. if, if I if someone's got criticism, it's always an opportunity to learn. Like 100%. regardless yeah. of if they're way ahead of you, way behind you or yeah. right next yeah. to you, like yeah. you can always learn from somebody else's opinion. And, and this yeah. is why just in the comment, I know review you guys, I can actually have a constructive yeah, yeah, conversation. No, it's not the, exactly. The comments were going crazy. Like people yeah, just people, getting, people taking people offense, get their they're getting triggered. It. And yeah, no, listen, yeah. you can do, because I feel like people can't take um, you know, again, people is an ego thing, right? Yeah, you can't, they, you can't like look look at the bad side. So of just something. think about it. if you've yeah. done something all your mm. investing career, like that's what your that's your bread and butter. Like mm. you, you you can try and say oh, it doesn't hurt, but it, there will be like this. Ah, oh, what yeah, do you mean? Course, so yeah. you're gonna get you're gonna get triggered. Yeah. But yeah, I know I know you can control and actually crit like actually critically yeah. think about what was being discussed, yeah. and then then actually make an informed decision based on what I'm saying, yeah, and mm -hmm. still have your opinion on that. So yeah, I know yeah. I know that's Kazi. So that, well, good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So obviously, <laughs> flipping. You were saying what you were saying. I, I don't know if you quite said BS. I know rent to rent. You said BS. Yeah. I said I said I said BS. I said okay. People, okay. I, I, said I said BS, I said okay, BS cool. and people are wasting the time doing it. Okay. And, cool. And and the context behind mm -hmm. what I was trying to discuss on on the podcast was, so again, I I, I guess for me I'm I'm equating to time to a lot of things that I, when I'm like analyzing. So yeah. flipping for me is one stability wise. As a vehicle, I don't see it because I, I I am required to go out there, find a property, refurb it, find a buyer to sell it and make profit. Mm. So I'm like, that is time. I could spend 12 months doing that process to make a, let's say, 100 grand profit. And all I've done is got, been given this chunk of money. But, and which, by the way, when I get this chunk of money, I'll likely pay tax on that money, depending on what, if it's company earnings, whatever, yeah. cool, we can work out profits, post, all of that. Um, but it's the activity of having to do the work like all the time to then generate the capital to yeah. then like make it. So for me, it's like, I want to do the work once and have a recurring income. And for me, that truly means that if I've done the work once and I don't do the work again, I still have that income coming in versus flipping. You do it once. Literally, if you don't flip something, God forbid, God forbid something happens to you, your earnings are cut off. That's it. That money you have will run out at some point. So what you do if all you've done is flip. Yeah. So, for me, there's a combination of strategies, a combination of things you can do, cool, whatever. But for me as a strategy on its own, doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand why people just do that and say, I'm just gonna flip and flip to the next pot and buy my pot of money to the next project and keep going and keep going and keep going. I'm like, well, what are you doing? You're not building, you're not building wealth. And I made the comment, you can carry on flipping and, and proceed as rich or become rich even. Mm -hmm. I am gonna create wealth because for me, once I have done the hard work once, that is now recurring income. Doesn't matter, like my, my portfolio now, 
that generates income regardless of whether I wake up, don't do anything, I'm in another country, it doesn't matter what I do. I can't stop that money from coming in. If I don't flip, I don't make money. Mm. So that's that's my philosophy around why I, I feel like feeling like people are wasting their time and energy into flipping where it's there's so many like uncertainties as well even around it. Trying to find an exit buyer, things get delayed, um, and you're, you're, the buyer comes, they want to buy it, and then changes their mind, pull out, you know, you're now on a bridge potentially about to expire, all these and again, we can talk about downsides about both strategies, but for me, it's not something I would want to invest my time into mm-hmm. when I know I want to create a foundation of income. Yeah. Um, so I'll have to keep working forever. Okay. And that's, that's, that's why I'm saying it's a waste of time. Cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, you heard it straight from him, yeah. the full concept. So, so let's, let's no, based unedited. on what I've said, from my context, what would you, would you, what, what would you say? I think, obviously, I think, t- to be fair to Alfred, obviously social media is hard mm-hmm. because... A lot of the time, you know, it's very short, sensationalized statements. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think the downside of what you said is you have to think like everything is fit for mm. purpose. I think you have to be conscious that being aware that you have a platform, there's people that look up to you, that listen to you. There's yeah. going to be that person who they, for all the right reasons, have just found their first deal. There is something they're going to flip. Yeah. They're going to hear that. They're going to look up to you and be like... Man, like, and you're so I just think sometimes we have to be conscious about what we say. And I know you're very like bullish with your opinions, and that's fine. I respect yeah, you yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah. But I think it's like there's some things like I saw you, I, I don't know if it was bought or rented, but I think you got this amazing house, really nice. Um, was it do you mind answering if that was bought or rented? Yes, yeah, so I rent, I rent. Oh, you rent it? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. okay, so that's very much in line with your strategy. But imagine you just bought that, and yeah. for whatever reason, you decided that buying made sense for you. Yeah. But a lot of people pitch in terms of you don't need to own where you live, and but you're yeah, buzzing yeah. over that. That, that, like, that's, so it's that's, like, that's, that's, that's that's for me is like yeah, no but philosophy, I'm, yeah. But that's so, your yeah. philosophy. But I'm saying for other people, that whole thing of like just kind of speaking very negatively on something that for a lot of reasons could be the right thing for somebody. You do have to be a little bit mindful of. Mm. But that's that's again, that's not for me to tell you how to. But that's just my opinion on it. When it comes to the actual um, flipping strategy, yeah, I think look like my. You have to bear in mind, obviously, I flip in, in London. Um, in terms of to give you some numbers, since 2017, flat prices in London have gone up around 4% from 2017 to now. And <clears throat> I'm sure our amazing host will go and get some data on that at some point. But that means if I was to retain these assets that are worth a million pounds, yeah, the level of money they would have made me over that seven years in terms of capital appreciation coupled with the rents would have been very minimal. In, in the grand scheme of things, in terms of the amount of capital that you had tied up in them. Now, flipping prop, flipping properties for me means that <clears throat> you can have the disposable income to branch out into whatever it is that you want to do, whether it be owning properties that make sense to own. Because when we speak to a lot of people in property and you're first starting to speak to somebody, you'll say, well, what are you getting into? Are you looking for capital appreciation? Are you looking for cash flow? And most people say both, but the reality is to try and find that property that works really well for both is often very difficult. And then you see a lot of people that spend forever sitting on money and not actually doing any deals. So a good example is a property that I bought recently, not recently, a couple of years ago, and I bought it as a house and converted it to three flats. So it's one of those deals where you can get all of your money back out. You buy it as a house for like 600,000, you spend 200,000 doing it up plus fees. They're worth in excess of 400,000 pounds each. So technically I could refinance yeah. and get all of that money back out because mm. at 75% loan to value, you would leave in like, you know, 300,000 pounds in the deal and you have these free flats and they're making you money forever. Passive, hands off. By the time you pay your mortgage, you can have them with, you know, a management company but they're making like 600 pounds per unit, you know, a month. So they're making you 1800 pounds a month. They're making you what? Close to 20 grand a year, but you've got 300,000. In that same year, I put that same 300,000 in to make 300,000. And yes, there's going to be capital. There's going to be capital. um, There's going to be tax effectively on it. So there's going to be corporation tax. However, even after paying that corporation tax, I feel like I'm in a stage of my journey where I'm much more about wealth creation and wealth preservation. And I think with the the HMO model, it's good. And I've got HMOs. I'm not the one to like sort of talk negatively on HMOs, but a lot of the time that argument about, oh, you have to go and find a buyer. We live in one of the most desirable cities in London, in one of the most desirable places in the world, even if you're not in London. Buyers, you know, with the standard, if you do stuff to a higher standard, 
finding a buyer, buyer is very easy because off the back end, you've either got to find a buyer or you've got to refinance. Both things you can be down to value as comments. Subject, and you know, in our world, that yeah, subject to value as comments it's, yeah, it's is right. probably one mm. of the worst five yeah, words yeah, yeah, in you yeah, know yeah, in the yeah, English yeah, dictionary yeah. strung together. Um, so we're all still at the mercy of finding an exit. The for me, it's actually more of a liquid asset than the HMO model. Because the HMO model, you have to find someone that wants a HMO. A lot of the time, particularly when you go into the, you know, Sue Jenner space, you're looking at people that are specifically looking at yield. Yeah. So you've got a very small target market to exit. So whilst you have a lot of equity built up in that property, your access is also very much linked to, well, what are interest rates like? So in terms of the viability of it, it also comes down to the exit. So it's very similar to, mm. you know, to the, the flipping model. But for me, I just say like, look, the reason why I, I didn't love the statement was because for somebody starting out, if I started out, when I started yeah, out, I started yeah. out with enough money to do one deal. Yeah. And you can say, oh, you can go and do X, Y, or Z. And there's always yeah. going to be options. Yeah. When you started in property, somebody could tell you, oh, why haven't you gone and started importing fruits from Nigeria? Because my friend now makes a million pounds a month. You're wasting your time. But I think there's always going to be a different option. There's always going to be a more profitable option. There's always going to be one that has higher risk, lower risk, but I think overall, you know, it's a very a strategy that if you long term want to own assets, if I owned the property that I first ever did yeah. and I sold for three hundred and ten thousand, yeah, right now that property is worth three hundred and forty thousand. That's how much it's worth and now. How long ago was that? About ten years ago. 10 and the years reason ago. why? Come on. No, no. It's I can guarantee you. I can. I'll give you the address of the property. Is it? I'll give you the only, address on the podcast right now. Like 70, 70, No, ninety. 97C Mayo Road, SE26. Interesting. So and the re- what, 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 what do you think is, is allowed so it to maintain To stay its, around the same yeah. is because doing, okay, maybe that wasn't the first property, but I'm talking probably 2015. So maybe not okay. the first, maybe like a couple of years on. Yeah, but yeah, like, yeah. The reason yeah. I saw it on, like, on the line is because when mm. you're doing a brand new product, in the same way when you do brand new rooms, a lot of the time they go through a curve where they're worth the most when they're brand new yeah, as a brand finished product. And, it, and, it kind of flattens and out, then yeah. they kind of flatten out and then they go up over time. Yeah. But it's like when you're creating these like brand new products, it's the same premium that people get from buying a new home, from buying a new car. Yeah. People are paying because it's brand new. Yeah. So you get the most amount of money day one for it. And if you want to claw all of that value back out, that's often the best time to sell. Now, the HMO model is very different in that mm. it's yield based. You can look at it on, like, you know, if it's got a track record of that, because if you turn around and say, oh, this is what it's worth in rent, until you really rent the rooms out, it's very subjective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Whereas there's a lot more data because it's a lot more common in, you know, in obviously the residential sale model. Um, but yeah, effectively, why I flip is if I would have just started out, I would have maybe had that one property. I probably could have refinanced for a little bit more a couple of years later, maybe. and but it would have been a lot of a, a slower slog in terms of time. Like that like people that know me know that I travel a lot. I think we, you know, I, I don't know who travels more, but I know we, we both probably travel quite a lot and manage to enjoy a lot of time freedom. And it's because as you grow, you have the ability to have a project manager to go and, you know, source deals or have someone to source him for you on your behalf. You pay for your time. So me paying a deal sourcer is me just paying to get my time, but me paying for a yeah. project. All of these things come off the bottom line. Yeah. But you're happy to pay for them because you've built up, whether you call it like a net worth or an ability mm. to play and and find better deals where the margins are higher. So I think this year we've we've currently sort of we've gone we bought six properties um well over the last two months, looking at acquiring a few more. And I think, you know, those those pro- projects, some of them, you know, as it's fifty thousand pounds profit, some of them are a couple of hundred thousand. Um, the ones that took longer that require planning are hopefully going to be closer to, you know, half a million. But I think in terms of what you want to do, that you're always, for everything, there's always going to be the what ifs. Like yeah. there's always going to be the what if, you know, your tradesmen mess you up. There's always going to be the what if your boiler breaks down. There's always going to be what if your tenants don't pay. There's always going to be these things that we have to consider. But in the grand scheme of things, I think, you know, both strategies are good. And for me, my argument was more so that both strategies work well when run simultaneously. Yeah. Because if I just flipped and didn't have the large capital, it, like if I just flipped and didn't have any stability, how would I pay my bills? So, okay. so, so, question for you then: If you can only pick one, what would you pick? Hold up, hold up, hold up, or flip? At my, in my current state, I f- flip a hundred percent. I think. Okay. I think so, 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 you do still be on the flip model, even though security-wise, your income can fluctuate. Or you, well, let's well, say something. Let's say because you actually have to keep working. 
Yeah, like if, if for example, and again, like we have to consider what we're basing on basing the models on because I'm, I'm just trying to like no, but the, yeah. The reason I asked that is because yeah. if you had to, if I can flip, if we're both saying okay, look, we both are in the same position, so we can both flip, yeah, and we can both continue to constantly raise investor finance as yeah. well because that's what your model relies on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like wholly, like if you can't raise investor finance, you can't continue to hold. Of course, yeah. So we have to base it both on those yeah. things. Um, yeah, like if I was to, if I could only do one, I'd flip because I'd have a lot more money. Okay. So you just keep working forever then? No, in my current state. That's why you ask me now. Okay. And that's why I'm saying like there's different stages of your journey. At a point in which like I want to like, you know, I could, could, because for example, off the back of flipping, because mm. I think the, the thing that maybe is a slight misconception is that you raising money is you working. You having to have those phone calls. You having to speak to investors. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm totally like you raising money as you work. Yeah, because you I'm not, I'm not. So no, no, okay. Don't get me wrong. I I love. I'm gonna. You know, I work. I, yeah. I love to work. I'm not even trying to retire or anything like yeah, that. So yeah. I, get, I get that. So I am gonna. I'm putting the work to build assets. But what I'm doing by building those assets, I'm doing the work once. So that's now recurring from there no, on. No, I get so, that. So so. But that, to that's... continue to buy those assets, you have to continue to raise capital. Yeah, and I'm always going to keep raising capital. To keep, yeah, keep but I'm saying, to... but that whole model of you're always keeping raising capital. Yes. For you to do that, you have to continue working. You have to continue having a profile. But I, to... but I can choose at any point to, to say, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to raise any more capital and, and live off my my in, income that I'm making from the from the property. But in the same way, pay off my investment. Say, hey guys, thanks. Yeah, and um, I'm the... no longer no longer offering opportunities for you guys to get a great return and on your in, money. In the same and way, that's it like, done. You know. When you choose to do that, you say, okay, you've got to pay these investors back and that's it done. When I choose to do that, I can just go and buy all those HMOs when I want them. I can, and I'll buy them at a premium. So I'll buy, I'll have to pay the premium because if I want to buy your portfolio, yeah. I have to now go and pay the yeah, premium, you're pay, to pay a premium. Yeah, yeah, you are. But in the short, the shorter term. <laughs> but do, do you see how no. your, your, your route of amassing money, mm -hmm. just let's learn well, forget just amassing money requires you to keep having to actively make that happen no because you have to keep actively making that happen because you have to keep in raise it so the, the thing is for both of us to facilitate doing what we're doing for you to build a hmo portfolio yeah. or, or whichever like yeah, look, yeah, i know yeah, you're doing yeah. a lot more than that but i'm yeah. just using that as the yeah. example for you to continue building a portfolio you have to continue raising money which you have to continue you can't turn off your phone and turn off your social media and continue to raise money. You have to continue doing that type of work. In terms of the way in which you do it, you can scale it back. And in the same way, I can scale it back by having a project manager, having, I don't have to go, like the last five projects I bought, I didn't view. Okay. So I didn't have to view them. I don't have to go there to manage the build. I'm not an architect. I'm not a solicitor. I'm not a project manager. I'm not a builder. I don't have to do any of those things. Same, same, same. Yeah. So, so, same, so, same, so, same, so, same, so, same. So it sounds like field, yeah. you're both, you both create, Let's not say wealth. You both create money in different ways. You, or you're both, but one's recurring and one isn't, and that's no, the point but, I'm trying to make. Which would, which, which would you have? Because that doesn't be any. But well, Kazi has lump sum, but, but but but, it's not, it's, but right. okay. One's recurring yeah. and one is one isn't. One requires you to actively go. So once I've made that recurring income, it's mm. it's gonna come regardless of if I do my next project or don't do my next project. No, but your but, next pot of profit. The point, has the point that you're missing is yes. Like if you're happy, if you are happy with having one property. Then after you had that one property, your recurring income would stay the same. You'd have to do nothing else. Agreed. Yes. yes. If you want to grow a portfolio, you have to continue working. Of course. And I'm not, so, that's, that's not, so, a, that's not so, a conversation. Though. The no, conversation but it is, is because you, you missed the point is that, that to grow that wealth, you have to continue working because you have to keep raising investor finance. For me to continue to do deals, I have to keep working. I have to keep doing deals because I grow the money with the deals that I'm doing. Uh, yeah, so we, so we, I get both vehicles require work. Yeah, but one has a vehicle whereby you do the work once, and income wise, it's recurring. The income remains the same. So I I'm still gonna I'm still gonna I'm, I'm trying to build million, millions of pounds in, in income a month. So I'm not gonna just stop working because I've got a few. But but I, I can I can. Yeah. Whereas with the the flip model, I feel like if you stopped, I stopped working. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to flip a single property ever again. You're gonna run out of capital at some point. No, whereas but, I'm not. But, but that capital is still in equity, mm -hmm. and also I've got income on top of but that. The, the, the difference between the two is that if you like, for argument's sake, you build yeah. a portfolio and it's paying you twenty thousand pounds a month. Yeah. Build a twenty thousand pounds a month portfolio. Yeah. And that's great. But yeah. if I then say, okay, you know what? For argument's sake, 
in that same period, I've made a million pounds net profit. Mm. Yeah. I can take that million pounds. I can go and buy whatever it is that I want to buy to make. And again, it's, I'm not saying it's the same because they're two yeah, random yeah, numbers. Yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. But I can just go and replace my income and make the same amount of money and stop working. Okay. Because the money, ref money is equal. Like money over here and money over there. Like I can, if you were the person who said, I've got all these houses, I'd yeah. say, okay, I'll buy them. And it's the same reason that like, when we talk about, you know, people that are saying that if you, a lot of people don't, the, the honest answer is a lot of people don't make their money in property. A lot of people make their money through other businesses and then use property as a vehicle to, to transition into, to start working. And yeah. obviously you're kind of doing that simultaneously. So you're building a portfolio whilst obviously building a business or building whatever other, the other stream of income alongside yeah. that is. And I think that's where I was saying the sort of the, the interesting part is that mo I've effectively taken property as my business that I'm working in to make money. And then at a point in which that, you know, I might say you're very right. I might say a couple of years time, you know what, if I go, if you go and take 10 million pounds, you go and take 10 million pounds. Yeah. You know what you can make monthly with 10 million pounds because by the time yeah. you know you look at the multiplier effect and that 10 million is 40 million if you control 40 million pounds worth of assets what's your monthly income going to be yeah. so it, it's very much the same thing i just think and it's just obviously it's different attitudes towards where our strengths lie if your strengths lie in raising capital then that's where you should focus yeah. because and if my strengths lie in the ability to find and execute deals that's where i should focus because that's what's ultimately going to make me more money in a shorter period of time. Yeah, look, I think you can go around. Yeah, I feel like you know. <laughs> okay, so I've got, I've got a question from uh, one of the subscribers, actually. I think this is specifically for you, Kazi. And actually, mm -hmm. Alfred, you can chip in as well. So it was like, what are the pros and cons of flipping properties in the current economic client? Is it still a viable option for anyone entering the property sector? intending on growing their income personal savings uh, see, see how that question already it just talks about flipping which is a for me a capital generation i.e yeah. like lump sums of money yeah but it ends with income yeah and this this is the point i'm trying to make so sometimes we'll go into certain strategies we're yeah. trying to trying to build this income thing which is the end yeah. goal but are in a vehicle that trucks out lump sums of money that I is think, not income that yeah. is lump sum of money that requires you to have to do again to have that lump sum Again, again, I think it's it's the question, obviously, of how how the question is phrased, and obviously, yeah. because a lot of people want to have their cake and eat it. But mm -hmm. this, this, yeah, this yeah. is where I'm I'm struggling to but like, understand. For me, it. like there's stuff that like I struggle to understand in a lot of models. Yeah, but I just, you know, I I don't think because for me, for example, like in the HMO space, yeah, I think you've got a load like a load of overvalued assets. And again, but it's just like, I think there's a load of overvalued assets that are valued based on yield that mm. don't really have an, a feasible exit on the open market. And I've seen example, I've seen HMO pro, by the way portfolios that sell for an amazing amount of money, but I've also seen people that have had to take massive hits and, you know, really when they're geared at 75%, when they go to exit, particularly if they want to exit in bulk, exit, you know, at probably like 15% off what they believe their market Lock value, value was, is, yeah. because the commercial valuation isn't the bricks and mortar valuation and it's a limited pool of buyers. But that being said, somebody like yourself's argument would be, well, I'm never planning to sell, so it doesn't bother me. No, no, I, I, I do think that, so, this, so for me, I will dispose of assets at some mm -hmm. point. There will, there will become a time point where the money I have in that in that portfolio does not make sense. Mm -hmm. I, I can allocate that the money in another vehicle where yeah. the, the income produced is much higher, the potential for appreciation is much higher. Mm -hmm. So you will, the, the whole, investment strat you got it it's a bit it's a bit of both like you're gonna have to you can't hold on to every asset forever yeah. you, could, you can choose to if you want to but yeah. if you are a good allocator of money and understand how money works you're gonna assess your portfolio at a point in time and assess is that money truly working hard for me yeah is that okay. the best place that money can and, be put and i think that holistically is like you know the answer to a lot of questions whatever you do whether you're working a nine to five whether you've inherited the money like money like is valuable it's if somebody's worked hard for it whether it's you or somebody else and you have to yeah. make that money work as hard for you as possible yeah. and for me when we look at the london market owning like a flat worth half a million pounds with you know 125 thousand pounds in a flat to make you 400 pounds a month mm -hmm. for that, me that sense, it yeah. doesn't make sense but what i would do is say you know what i'm gonna sell the property yes i'm gonna like take a hit on capital gains but let me go and buy something specific with that hundred thousand i it might be a hmo that i've got to leave the same amount of money yeah. in. It might be a commercial unit, but it's going to yield a lot better because just because I've said, okay, you know what? I want to hold something. doesn't mean I should hold anything. 
And I think that's where, you know, th there are properties that I've held and properties I've held because they made sense as HMOs, they made sense as yeah. maybe mixed use buildings, they made sense as commercial buildings, or they made sense as, you know, Airbnbs and other things in the short term. Um, but I try and hold with purpose rather than attachment, because when you do that, that's when you end up with a very sort of mismatched, inefficient portfolio. Yeah. And you've worked really hard for this money. So like, make sure it's working just as hard for you as you work to get it in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we're both aligned on that for yeah. sure. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah like that, that yeah, was me agreeing. So, yeah, that yeah. was Alfred's point. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, me yeah, like, reiterating yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So I had another question mm -hmm. from uh, the subscriber. So... Um, subscribers, should I say. So in the rental space, it says no secret landlords favor renters to professionals. Whilst this may benefit landlord, this is a form of economic bias. Why? What do you both think can be done to correct this problem and make the process of renting more of an equal playing field for renters? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a landlord, we're both landlords. Like, so yeah. obviously the, the reason why it's favored to professionals because we, the, the, there is opportunity to earn more through professionals. Yeah versus other tenant profiles. So yes, it's going to be biased, unfortunately, because ultimately the person who owns the property is, is wants to pay the mortgage, pay their bills, yeah. cover everything. And they can't, they, they're not charity. So they can't just say, we're going to just put somebody in there just and take the bare minimum rent and just cover mm -hmm. their expenses. Like mm -hmm. it just doesn't work as a business model. We're in a capitalist society. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's, it's hard. That, that is a, hard, a genuine hard question. Like I appreciate it. Like there are, there needs to be mm -hmm. like a, an even amount of this type of demographic for tenants uh, property wise and all that different demographic wise in reality it's hard it's but hard to I, I think it is top level so if for example the planning process was streamlined and you know alfred you've recently gone through some planning applications yeah. for flat conversions and like let's say for example they made planning a lot easier so more favorable for developers but off the back of saying it's easier and gave developers opportunity to make more money mm. there was maybe a higher social housing allowance or something like that yeah. that meant okay, you were incentivized to make more affordable homes. Yeah. Because if the governments aren't meeting their affordable homes targets and creating stuff for social housing, they can't put the burden on private landlords to yeah. do that. And I think if yeah. it came from like a government initiative or just an effectively subsidized rent, so for example, mm. where it would rent at open market prices, but you know, you would pay a, a percentage of it. And I think also just like things, like even sometimes when we look at our mortgage conditions and our um, building insurance, like some building insurance has a caveat that says it's required working professionals or your building oh, really? insurance is higher. Oh, okay. um, I didn't yeah. know that. So I these are uh, things that. that are in place okay. that are not down to the landlord, as Alfred mentioned, that if it's going to cost you more money, yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, you know, the majority of landlords are, are there to make money and they've got bills to pay as well. So... It kind of sounds like to me the current environment or the let me know I don't want to put too much on government and that but the current environment means no, that but I think who else is it going to be on because it can't be on me and no, Alfred it yeah, has to be on the yeah, government yeah, yeah. I'm not taking responsibility yeah. for the housing okay right. but is it always been like that or has it shifted more towards that I guess no. from your points of view of obviously being in industry for a while. I think, you know, so there's, there's been changes in place. Like before you used to see adverts yeah. would say like no DSS and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and obviously there has been changes, but I think people have always preferred, generally speaking, yeah. to rent to where there's more security. And the same yeah. reason that if, if somebody's a doctor mm. and they're on a high salary and they can easily cover the rent times 10, for example, yeah. versus somebody who's just starting out as self-employed and they're saying, look, just trust me, I'm going to make this good. Like you're just going to have an, from a, a risk yeah. perspective and risk and reward and all our decisions are made on the risk exposure. Like most people won't expose themselves to more risk yeah. for, you know, if anything, like less reward. Mm. Okay. 100%. I want to ask you something about the budget as well, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously the budget came out. So something caught my eye. So so it was mentioned that if someone sells a property that isn't their main home mm. and they're a higher rate taxpayer, they will pay 24% tax on profits they make from April instead of 28%. I guess what are, you, what are both your thoughts on those changes and will that have like a wider impact on the property market? Not, not, so, yeah, so not really because yeah. the majority of like uh, property investors that do mm. it, you know, where before changes in taxation, it was slightly different. But now if you speak to, you know, a, a tax advisor, most people are going to tell you it's more efficient to buy in a limited company. So most people that are actively buying and selling properties are doing so in, you know, in companies. Yeah. For those, you know, there are people that have struggled because of increased interest rates. And for those people that are exiting, it may be more of an incentive to sell. 
But I think the issue is we're already having quite a, a large exodus from the residential sort of like that or the, the private landlord market. And I think if anything, things like that, yes, it may save some people some tax when they're selling up, but the reality is we actually need more landlords because there's an undersupply of property. And that's why yeah. I'm sure you will be able to, to touch on this more than myself, but rental prices are like through the roof. You put yeah. an advert on now, you're, especially for rooms and things that are quote unquote affordable, yeah. you're looking at hundreds of ap applications in a week because it's under supply. Yeah, is that? Is I don't that know how you're yeah, finding it. Yeah, it yeah. So your... Rents have increased. I keep telling them, look, uh, I'm a big believer rents is going the wrong way. And one can argue why we need to mm. do rent caps, which obviously as a landlord, I'm not, I'm not pro- um, rent capping because if I'm providing a good product, why would mm. I be um, accepting a rent cap for the product I'm putting yeah. out to the marketplace? So that's that's the nature. Unfortunately, like rents are have been increasing um, in, in 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 relation to obviously interest rates increasing as well, and that's another factor. Like bills have gone up, interest mm. rates have gone up. Yeah, we're not. It's not. You know, we're not charity. So yeah. it, for it to make sense, the rents have to go up, and the demand, to be honest, has been there for those rooms anyway. So it's not like we're just putting the rents up for because we want to be greedy and put the rents up for the sake mm. of putting it up actually the market has driven that yeah. naturally so okay yeah cool all right so i had another question from the budget so if you purchase more than one property in a single transaction the government has scrapped multiple dwellings relief alfred this is for you does it apply to hmos does um so, so multiple HMOs? dwellings like if you're selling if you're so before yeah. you could sell a portfolio mm -hmm. um and you'd, you'd kind of not have this um you'd have a relief for yeah. selling a, a bunch of properties in one go. Mm. And now they basically just scrap that, which obviously now means if you want to sell a portfolio as, as one go, you're, you're not going to get the benefit mm. anymore. So just, you're going to be taxable. You're not going to go and sell off a portfolio okay. one, for one transaction. You're going to try and- I don't mm. get it. So, uh, it, so, so basically yeah, it's like- it's it's interesting. Um, so stamp duty effectively is yeah. in tiers. Yeah. So you, for arguments, I can't remember what they are currently, but for argument's sake, say Keep it's up to, up to a certain yeah. amount, it's 1%, up to another mm. amount, it's 2%. So, yeah. But in London, you quickly hit those thresholds. So for example, if I buy, recently I was looking at a building um, that's going to be around a million pounds yeah. in Clapham and it was as sold as two flats. Yeah. So rather than pay the stamp duty at 3% on everything Every above 500,000, yeah. mm. I would pay the stamp duty relatively to two transactions. So okay. both transactions, you would benefit from the lower threshold of yeah. each flat as opposed to the whole transaction as a whole. Okay. So that's... So, but then you're not incentivizing people to sell then either, right? It sounds like, right? Yeah, I think if people yeah. want to dispose of a lot of assets. They're, they're so not, like, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to st stagger it. Like, this, this yeah. is the bit. Like, you, I don't even. I don't get it. it like, no, basically like, now it's the same. So if you want to yeah. sell, but I think the way they're looking at it is, look, if yeah. you want to sell, you've got to sell. We're not offering yeah. any like yeah. relief, to, any relief, relief or anything like that. Um, but then if you offer the relief, then don't you kind of get more incentives to buy, buy, buy in a bulk? Yeah. Then, well, not, but then also you have to look at it like this. Mm. If, for example, there's a, they're not meeting, you know, the new homes, you need properties yeah. to come to market. Somebody selling a portfolio of properties can only yeah. go to a limited number of buyers that are willing okay. to buy an entire yeah. Right, okay. So Somebody that's though, okay. buying, enough, selling enough. 20 properties. Now you've got right, 20 okay. new properties to come to market that could all be for first time buyers. So I'm not okay. necessarily that against it. If you look at things like, yeah. you know, from you know, kind of a more utilitarian standpoint of, okay, what okay. is going to make a market fairer? It's okay. it because effectively it was offering a discount to those of a significant amount of money. So yeah, to, to be fair, I think this probably more will hit someone that's probably one owns the property in your names. Cause if you're owning a company, this is kind of irrelevant because you yeah. have, you're, you're selling the, the company, the shares of the company and you're mm. transferring the wealth that way. So it's, okay. you're not paying this, this disappears. So, if you've got property in your name, you're trying to sell that and there's multiple units in that property, yeah. then yeah, the person who's buying from you is going to feel the pain of paying the stamp duty for each yeah. individual. You don't get a relief across the, the multiple units you're buying. Yeah. Um. So, but that's whoever's buying is part of the maths now, part of the business. You add, mm. to, add to your numbers. Okay, cool. All right, so this final question to wrap this up. So obviously you both, you know, started the, we're now three months into the year, so quarter into the year. Kazi, obviously I spoke to you a few weeks ago. Alfred, I spoke to, to you like towards uh, December, end of December last year, right? Yeah. Now, obviously, you now got the picture, interest rates going down, etc. You know, I think the economy is all right. I think we heard today that it, it, it grew again slowly. Mm -hmm. So I guess what's your thoughts on the, you know, state of the property market? What do you kind of like envisage the year will be? It's one of these like magic ball yeah. questions. For me, I, I do believe the rates will come down at some point. Um, whether it's this year, next year, mm. they they will they can't sustain where they are at the moment. Um, but not to say that again for people looking to start in, I can I can appreciate yeah. people starting out at the moment complaining the rates are super high. Mm. But for me, I have a long term 
a view on property investing. So it's like, for me, property's always for sale. Property's always cheap. Because I, I, if I'm buying the right property's places- always cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, because I, and I kind of made this uh, comment in, in, the, in the previous podcast yeah. I did where I said, look, imagine people that bought in properties in London 30 years ago. Some, uh, some yeah. properties were like 200 grand. That, um, yeah. uh, that same property is now worth 600 grand, yeah. depending on what it is and where it is in, in London, obviously. Mm. But, so for me, it's like, I, I prefer that anyone that's kind of coming into the market, if you're concerned about interest rates, you can complain about them. But just think in 20, 30 years time of holding an asset, you're going to be thankful you came to the market at that time, still went in rather than say it's too high. And potentially it, keep, it, keep, it, can, go, it can go that way as well. It can keep going high, higher and higher. Then you're never going to get in the market. So you just lost two, three years, four, four years, however long it takes to restabilize and come back down again, if yeah. it ever does. So you're going to not, not buy property. So for me, it's like you've got to just think long term of property. And as long as your cash flows, i.e. this profit you're generating from the property, what is for me, I don't see the problem. Yeah. Um, you go in and you have the long-term view and you're going to sell an asset, benefit through the cash flow you, you achieve. And then in the future, when the debt goes down, you're laughing. Yeah. Um, you can refinance, pull money back out. And mm -hmm. if you want if you want to, of course, um, and reinvest into new assets. Okay. Cool. What about yeah. you, Kazi? In terms thoughts? of the market? Um, I think, yeah, I yeah. think interest rate wise, I think, they're probably going to come down a bit, probably not loads, but a little bit. I think we're in a, in, a, in an economic position where we're trying to stabilize. I think particularly because we're in an election year, mm. I think we are going to so. see some, you know, some stimulus incentives yeah, in the property space, which means oh, you think if so? you can okay. get in beforehand, yeah. I definitely, you know, okay. basically pre-election, everybody's all, all clamoring for it, votes. Everyone's trying to everyone's trying to get the, the votes, isn't it? So, yeah, you know, yeah, they're gonna, that's true sell you on what they're going to do for capital yeah, gains. They're going true. to tell you what they want to do yeah. for yeah, all so, these I mean, things. Yeah, you saw yeah. recently <laughs> Michael Gove spoke about wanting to build like 1.5 million homes and all of these things. But I think the reason I mentioned that is because mm. you're probably going to see like a little bolster to the market. It's not going to go back to where it was before in terms so, of yeah. there being, you know, open house days with queues out the door. Mm. But regardless of your strategy, Alfred hit the nail on the head when he said like, as long as you buy for the right price at the beginning, you've insulated yourself and, and you can make money and you know prices long term are only really going one way whether it's slow increase slow and steady they're only going one way but you know my strategy personally whenever there's threats to the market there's more opportunities to make money so when people are saying don't buy you can be more bullish with your offers when you know people are struggling to sell you can, you can be a little bit more creative when it comes to the ways in which you structure yeah. deals off the back end, I've always been a big champion in terms of like the finished product. Um, and I think a lot of people are now sort of moving towards that. But what I've seen is, you know, it's like the, the Louis Vuitton model that they don't advertise, they don't do sales. But even if everybody else is on sale, if you've mm -hmm. done a, if you've created a product that is head and shoulders above the rest of the market, there can be 50 similar flats in the area. But yeah. if somebody wants yours, they've got to pay the price you're asking. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, that's been how I've been able to remain successful in flipping in a market that has been pretty stagnant okay. so i plan to continue doing that um and hopefully hopefully everything goes well okay we've got a lot of projects sort of kind of have scaled up in terms of volume mm. um so yeah just excited excited to see okay how so you're go. both excited on both ends so you're both bullish on profit see might you might be clashing on it but you do you know what i think so great about this conversation right it just shows two different approaches mm -hmm. that can be successful that's the importance of this conversation. It's not about choosing one. It's giving people options and they can say, okay, you know what? Actually, I like Alfred's route. I'll go down that route. Mm -hmm. I like Kazi's route. I'm going to go down that route. That's the importance of this conversation mm -hmm. that people can identify those multiple routes to, to yeah. ultimately get to whatever goal you think it, it is, which is to make money, right? It's to make money, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, it, that's right? it, right? So I, mean, I think me and Alfred have always been aligned in that yeah. space that, you know, you have to play to your strengths. Mm -hmm, Whatever yeah. works for you, do that. Like, it's always good to explore other options, to have conversations. And I think it's also always good for somebody to test your theory. Yeah. Like, if you think you're really good at something and think it works wholly for you, an amazing opportunity is for somebody to pick holes in it because all it does is going to make your structure stronger. Yeah. So if Alfred comes and says, oh, I think this, this, and this is an issue, him highlighting those issues means that I'm going to have an opportunity, if you see it as my castle, to build those walls, like, you yeah, know, to put yeah, a floor, to put a mold yeah, in, and vice versa. So I, I don't, you know, people are sometimes scared of criticism, but for yeah. me, I love it. Like, criticism is an opportunity yeah. to grow. Yeah, yeah. constructive yeah. criticism, you're like, yeah, and that's, that's the great, it's a growth opportunity, like yeah. you said, and you strengthen off the back of that if you're on board and open-minded, mm -hmm. and then 
yeah, keep building. Yeah, love that, love that. Okay, Kazi, where can people find you if they wanna? Um, so yeah, you? find me property by Kazi um, on Instagram on where am I on YouTube? Mm. YouTube we're at 10k now, so we're excited. Mm. The podcast coming out, gonna get Alfred back on soon to just <laughs> stress him out some more. Um, but yeah, man, that's that's me. LinkedIn, uh, I don't really use loads, but Kazim Ali Balogun. Um, but yeah, just connect with me. Always looking to meet with new people, new opportunities. Cool. Do you have any final words for watchers, listeners? Um, yeah, follow Alfred. He's a nice guy. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Alfred, uh, what about you? Where can people find you? Um, so Alfred Jade, all over socials, pretty much. You can you can find me with my name. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm back on YouTube now finally. Um, so looking forward to putting some more value yeah. out there and dominating and as well. Yeah. So we'll see we'll see how that goes. But yeah, excited to be back on there. No cool. follow Kazi. <laughs> I mean, oh, <laughs> say five don't say five words, bro. Wait, take, take it easy. All right, all right, all right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me, oh, get, ready. Let me oh, get ready. What's your final word? Let me get ready. Bring it, bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Has you to tell him that the main man there, make sure you follow him. Oh, just okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the podcast and we'll see you next week's episode.